Okay, children may be dismissed at Children's Church. And uh, you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be in verses 5 through 18. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one in the chair in front of you there. It's on page 1276, the Pew Bible. So last week we looked at the first of five warning signs that the author uh, puts up here, warning these Jewish believers to not turn away from Jesus and his gospel. He is the only hope of salvation that they have, and he's the only hope that we have. But I'm sure that he anticipated some of their pushback, even as he was writing this letter. He's been encouraging them, encouraging them not to, to drift away from the message that they've heard. Jesus is better than the old way, than the, the old covenant. He's better than angels. He's the radiance of the glory of God. He's the exact imprint of his nature. He's the creator, the sustainer, the, the purifier of sins, the, the heir of all things, the, the one who will one day rule over everything. Jesus is the Son the very Son of God. And he used their, their very own Old Testament uh, scriptures to, to make these points. But you can almost hear their unspoken response to all of this. Yeah, well, if that's true, then why did Jesus come as a man? I mean, I mean, if, if he's better than angels and he's the Son of God, then, then why did he come as flesh and bone? I mean, as just a man. Well, the writer to the Hebrews answers that question in, in this next section. So let's take a look and see what he tells them. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 5 through 18. For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come, of which we are speaking. It has been testified somewhere, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you care for him, made him for a little while lower than the angels. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control, at present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. For it was fitting that he, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers, saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children God has given me. Since, therefore, the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. For surely it was not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. So the reason, the answer to the reason why Jesus came as a man could be, could be answered with two pretty simple statements. First, we're a mess. Amen? I mean, we are a mess. And then the other would be, you can't understand a person until you walk in their shoes, right? How many of you here have moved? We, we moved recently. I know Lori did just a few weeks ago, right? All the way across the country. 
And as careful as you may be packing, you, you end up finding yourself surrounded by hundreds of boxes, maybe even 560 of them, right? Huh? 628, okay? <laughs> Not that she's counting. <laughs> But you can find yourself, uh, you, you can't find anything. You have all them boxes, and, the, and as, as, as much as you take time to write everything down, you, surrounded by all of that, you can't find anything. You find yourself tired and, and frazzled and, and anxious. And then you get the call. The drywaller is coming to finish the upper room on Wednesday. But they can't get the drywall up there because, because the library is full of boxes. What are you going to do? You can't move all them boxes by yourself. You find yourself in a mess, and you need help to fix it. You need help to do what you can't do for yourself. See, that's the problem. God has big plans for us. The writer has just been talking about angels, but in, then in verse 5 he says, For it was not to angels that God subjected the world to come of which we are speaking. In other words, angels are, are a big deal. They're greater than humans. We've talked about that before over the last couple weeks. But they're not the ones to whom God has subjected the world to come. To whom is, has God subjected the world to come? To Jesus, right? That's Jesus' destiny talked about that last week and the week before. Jesus will one day rule over all of creation. Again, he's reminding them that Jesus is greater than angels. But then here he also reminds them of man and our destiny. He goes on to quote Hebrew scriptures to talk about what God intended when he created humanity. In verses 6 through 8, he quotes Psalm 8, 4 through 6. Psalm 8, 4 through 6. What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You have given him dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. This psalm tells of man's greatness, but it also tells of his unimportance. Because it begins in verse 3. If you begin in verse 3, it says, When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place. When, when, I, when I take in all that you made, when I look around and I, and I see the moon and, and the stars and, and, and everything that you made, what is man? What is man that, that you would even think about us, like, as if we're anything special. I mean, you think you're impressive? Put yourself next to Mount Everest. You think you're powerful? Put yourself against the river that carved the Grand Canyon. You think that you can roar? Stand beside Niagara Falls and, and yell all you want. Think you're stoic? How do you compare to the redwoods of California? Think you're beautiful? You ever seen a sunrise? A sunset? Compared to God's power and the majesty of His creation, people are really insignificant. Yet, the psalmist goes on to tell the special place of mankind. Second part of verse 7. You have crowned him with glory and honor, putting everything in subjection under his feet. God crowned people with glory and honor when he created them in his own image. Genesis 1.27. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created them. Male and female he created them. We are the image bearers of God himself. None of creation can claim that. And God, gave, God gave man tremendous authority in taking care of the world, putting all things in subjection under his feet. Genesis 1.28. 
Genesis 128. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Not even angels are are given this authority or responsibility. God intended this key role for mankind, for you, for me. And even though we may not be as majestic as Mount Everest, God has given us an important role in this world. You were made in God's image with the authority to rule the world on his behalf. You have dignity and purpose. But here's the problem. We've made a mess of this responsibility, haven't we? How many of you have experienced being assigned some special task at work? Some of you may be retired now, but think back to when you were working. You know, one that your boss was really counting on you to do. But it didn't go well. Well, not only have we not done a good job, but we have completely and utterly failed at our job, our responsibility that God gave us. God put us here to manage and care for His creation, to bring out His glory and splendor. But we rebelled against Him. The world, the mess, All you have to do is is check the news to see how badly we've done. The reason is sin. Sin has damaged this world and our ability to play the role that God designed us to play in this world. That's why in verse 8 he says, Now in putting everything in subjection to him, he left nothing outside his control. That means everything. We had responsibility for everything. He didn't hold anything back. At present, we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That's an understatement. Creation was meant to be subject to, me, to humanity, but it's not. It feels like things are, are out of control. We feel that tension every day, don't we? The tension that the original audience would have felt. We, 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 feel, we feel it as the world spins out of control all around us. We're not in control. Here's the thing. It's our fault. It's our fault. Adam and Eve, mankind, was given this responsibility in the garden. But they and we, we sinned. We messed it all up. Now as Romans 8.22 says, all creation groans, longing to be, to be reconciled because of it. This is the problem. God gave us a job to do, and we've made a mess of it. Our only hope is to get some help. Our only hope is to get some help. And that's just what God has provided God's solution, verses 9 through 18, gives us the solution. Jesus became one of us to do what we could not do for ourselves. Look at verse 9. But we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels, namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. Chapter 1 has been all about Jesus being greater than the angels. Now the the writer gives us an amazing insight. The one who is greater than the angels was temporarily made lower than them. Now he's not only talking about his incarnation, but we we celebrate at Christmas, but about his suffering, his death. The exalted Jesus that we've been talking about uh, became one of us. And not only that, he suffered and died. It's mind-boggling, yet yet it's true. God, God's Son, the Creator, the Sustainer, came as a man. He suffered and He died. We were in trouble, so God sent help. The exalted one we've been talking about these last couple of weeks. 
joined us to give us the help that we desperately needed. Look at verse 10. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist and bringing many sons to glory should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. The part about being made perfect through suffering, suffering doesn't mean that there was anything deficient in Jesus that needed to be, needed to be corrected. It has the sense of completion. That Jesus completed the mission that the Father had given him. He's perfectly qualified and equipped for the role that God prepared for him. Now notice that word founder in verse 10 where it calls Jesus the founder of our salvation. The word founder there means more than you think. It's also translated some, some, uh, some places as, as pioneer, others originator, others the author. A pioneer opens up the way for others to follow. The originator or the author is the one that brings it into being. You don't have a book until the author writes it. The founder is the one that is, it is based on, who establishes it. The word was used in ancient Greek mythology of, of Hercules as a champion who entered the world, wrestled with evil forces, and won and saved his people. All of these speak to what Jesus did for us. Jesus was the, the perfect sacrifice that he pioneered. He led the way for our salvation because of his suffering. He is the one that brought it into being because of what he suffered for us. Our salvation was founded, it was established upon his suffering on the cross. Without, without that, there would be no salvation. He entered the world, he wrestled and overcame sin and evil on the cross of Calvary. He is the victor, the champion of our salvation. Now notice the contrast between Jesus and, and us. God gave us a role, and we failed miserably. God gave Jesus a role, and he completed it perfectly. That makes him qualified. All humanity failed except one, Jesus. He succeeded where we didn't. The first Adam failed. That's why we needed the next Adam, the second Adam. That's why Jesus came to do what we couldn't do. Jesus became human to carry out an assignment from his Father. And to do this, he had to become one of us. Verse 11 says, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. And then he quotes two Old Testament texts that speak of, of Jesus' solidarity with us. Psalm 22, 22 and Isaiah 8, 17 through 18. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. That's Psalm 22, 22. There, David is writing that psalm. So David couldn't contain himself. He said he had to loudly testify to God's great mercies. In the midst of the congregation, he was going to tell everyone what he had done. Isaiah, waiting on the Lord's deliverance in Isaiah 8, 17 through 18, says, I will wait for the Lord, and I will hope in him. Behold, I and the children God has, have, has given me. And there, Isaiah had encouraged the people not to listen to, to false advice, to, to false teachers, but to, to listen to God alone to put their trust in God alone. Like Isaiah, Christ put his trust in God the Father. In John, John 10, 28-29, Jesus explained this trust. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Like those that faithful to God in Isaiah's day, we should stay true to Christ and ignore the falsehoods that would distract us and, and lead us away from following Him. We should fully hope and trust in the deliverance that He brings. Now also in here, congregation has the word ecclesia. 
ecclesia in it. You probably recognize that. That's the same word that we, where we get the word church. The ecclesia, we, we are the called out, we are the church. Praise to God comes from both the Son and from those who love the Son. His church. We should praise God for that great hope that we, securely, that we are securely His. Jesus stands in the midst, in our midst, in the midst of the congregation. Jesus came and he entered into our mess, to the mess of humanity. Jesus became human to do what humanity couldn't do for itself. We failed, and so Jesus joined us as our leader to do what we couldn't do. What exactly did Jesus do when he joined us? Well, he did three things here that I see. First, he, he overcame death. Verse 9, by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Tasted doesn't mean sipped. He didn't, he didn't sip it. It's a Hebrew term that means to, to taste fully. He gulped it. He drank it all the way. Every last drop. Verses 14 and 15 say, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil, and deliver all those through, who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Here the, the writer lays out why it's so important for Jesus to become man. Death is the common fear, the final experience of, of all people. And only as a man made of flesh and blood could Christ actually die he had to be like us so that he could actually die like us he had to be like us so that he could represent us when he overcame and defeated death ironically to defeat to defeat death christ had to die only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death it says his death and then his resurrection showed that death had been defeated Romans 6, 9. Romans 6, 9. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Now, how does, how does the devil have the power of death? Well, Paul explained it in Romans. Romans 5.12 Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Sin and death are, are interconnected. Sin results in death. We all know that. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is what? It's death, right? People have always feared death. And that fear motivates them to eat right, to exercise, to take vitamins, to go to the doctor. It preoccupies people so much that the writer says that people are slaves to the fear of dying. But we know that, that death strikes everyone. None of us are getting out of this alive, right? But through Christ, we no longer need to be afraid of dying, or of death. Christ died and rose again, and only in this way could he deliver, set humanity free. We know that because Jesus died and rose from the dead, that we will too. Jesus has promised eternal life with him, and, and we can trust him in that promise. We will die physically, but we will receive new bodies and a new life in eternity. So death actually becomes the gateway to new life. It's not the end. It's a new beginning. To be absent from the body means to be present to the Lord, right? Only one person has gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with death and won. Billions of people have died over thousands of years, but only one has died and come back to life. He's defeated death, and the one who has the power of death, the devil, so we no longer have to be afraid. If you've trusted Jesus, you no longer have to fear death. Because Jesus 
has defeated it. You no longer need to be afraid of death. If you know Jesus, if you've put your trust in Him, you have the promise, new life. Where, O oh death, is your victory? Where, O oh death, is your sting? If you know Christ, that should be on the tip of your tongue every moment. You should have no fear of death. But that's not all that Jesus has done. He also dealt with God's wrath. Verses 16 through 17. For surely it is not angels that he helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect, so that, we, that, so that he might become a merciful and a faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Angels were not the subject, the object of God's grace. God sent Jesus to die for people. Abraham's descendants who were lost in sin. Galatians 3.29, and if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. Jesus did not become an angel. He became a man in order to help men. How did he help man? How did he help us? He not only defeated death, but he made propitiation for our sins. What does propitiation mean? That fancy word. It means to sacrifice, a sacrifice to satisfy. Because of our sin and rebellion, we deserved God's wrath. A holy God cannot overlook sin. It must be punished. It must be paid for. But Christ is our high priest, intercedes for us. He offers the sacrifice that satisfies the debt that is owed. And unlike earthly priests, Jesus, our high priest, offered the perfect sacrifice. That sacrifice was his life. Jesus shed his own blood to make atonement. Romans 8.3 For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemns sin in the flesh. Christ's death on the cross satisfied the wrath of God. It paid our sin debt, and it took away its grip on our lives. Anyone who trusts Christ no longer faces God's wrath because Jesus did. The wrath of God because of what Jesus did, because he represented us as our high priest. He interceded for us. He offered the sacrifice once and for all for our sins. The sacrifice that satisfies. Jesus died to defeat sin and death, but there's one more thing. He's able to help you when you're tempted. He said he had to be made like his brothers in every respect. Jesus knew what it was like to be a helpless baby, a growing child, a maturing adolescent. He, he, knew what, he knew what it was like to, be, to get tired, hungry, thirsty. He knew what it was like to be despised, rejected, or falsely accused. He experienced physical suffering and death. All of this was, was, was part of his, his training to be our faithful and merciful high priest. He understands us because he was made like us. He came to earth as a man so he understands our weaknesses. Verse 18 says, For because he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Has anyone in here been tempted in the past 24 hours? Amen? Of course you have, right? Do you know who's able to help you? Jesus. Jesus is. Because, why? Because he was tempted too. He was tempted too. Jesus never experienced temptation before he became human. 
He was sinless. But, but he sure knew what it was like to be tempted. Even every sin that you and I are tempted with, he was tempted with too. From the, temp, from the temptations, the tempting, the, the testing that he experienced through his life, growing up from a baby into a man, he walked through, he walked through this world the same fallen world that you and I have. He faced all the same temptations that you and I face. Yet he did not sin. He faced the temptation, Satan's temptations in the wilderness. And even the temptation found in the drops of blood that he shed in prayer before his crucifixion in the garden. Just let this cup pass from me temptation to turn away from that the final part of the plan say no I've done enough I don't want to do anymore but he didn't give in to that temptation Jesus knows what we're going through he can help us he understands he can provide Grace and mercy in our time of need. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. First Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. God gives grace and mercy in our time of temptation. He understands. He understands the temptations that we face. And He's there to help us. He provides a way out from underneath that temptation. Here's what this passage is telling us. God gave humans a role to play in this world. But we failed. And this world is a mess. But God sent Jesus to do for us what we couldn't do for ourselves. He became our leader. He overcame death. He dealt with God's wrath. And then present tense, He is able to help us with our struggles. Continually present tense, right now. Even as you're sitting there right now tempted to nod off, He's able to give you what you need, to give you the grace to to stay awake. Whatever sinful thought comes into your mind, He is able to help you resist that temptation. Is able to help us with our struggles. Think about what it means that Jesus entered into our mess to help us. How many of you have experienced something like this at home? Like maybe hearing some kind of commotion come out of the kitchen. Oh no, you got to be kidding me! You walk around the corner and you look, and you see your, your, your wife or your husband standing there standing in the middle of the room with this 40 pound bag of rice except for the bottom is open and the rice is all over the floor yikes i'm out of here didn't see nothing right just going to pretend I didn't see a thing. You leave them to clean it up all by themselves. Well, we know that kind of temptation, don't we? I mean, who wants to get involved in that? It's hard to, to run in, into the mess when one occurs. I mean, who wants to run in there? Oh, let me help you clean that all up. No, it's, it's so much easier just to, whoops. And I didn't even see it. Oh, what happened, honey? I didn't even know. I'm sorry. It's so much easier to, to, to turn and 
to run the other way. Praise God, that's not what Jesus did. Jesus saw the mess that we created through sin. We deserved nothing but God's judgment. We had no right to expect anything but his wrath. But Jesus willingly willingly entered the mess for you and for me. Jesus isn't scared of your mess. He's not turning away from you. No matter how bad your life is, no matter how much you've rebelled against him, Jesus has never turned away from anyone who came to him. Have you done that? Have you turned to him? Come to him. Don't waste a minute. Jesus does not turn away from us. Jesus enters into our mess. Sometimes we think that there's no way that God could understand our struggles. But this passage says, God the Son, Jesus, more than understands. We made a mess. We needed outside help. Jesus became one of us to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. What a Savior. What a God that would do that. Amen? No wonder. No no wonder I've decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. God who would enter into my mess. I mean, you don't know. You don't know the mess my life is. Yet, Jesus entered into my personal mess. He didn't look at me and go, oh, <laughs> I, that one just, I don't even want to get involved in that one. How many of us do that? We see somebody maybe a family member, made a mess of their life. I'd kind of like to help, but, oh, geez. I don't even know if I've got the energy for that. Man, I just, I don't want to get sucked into that vortex. Just easier it is to turn and walk away. Praise God, Jesus doesn't do that. No matter how how bad you messed up, Jesus will never turn away. He understands. He sympathizes. He empathizes with you and your struggles. He was tempted too. What a Savior. Choose Jesus who came to do what you couldn't do for yourself. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord Jesus, we come before you and we thank you. That even though we we failed in the job that you gave us, we, we messed it up horribly. We continue to mess things up. We make a mess of our lives. We've made a mess of this world. But Jesus, you didn't turn your back on us. You entered into our mess. You came and you cleaned us up. You paid the debt that was owed. You redeemed us out of that. Jesus, we just... How could we not choose you? How could we choose anything else? How could we go back to anything else after what you have done for us? Pray that you would help us. Help us in our temptations. Help us to turn from those things that you would give us a way out. That you would show us that grace and that mercy. 
that we need, you would help us to live a life that honors and glorifies you for all that you have done. Jesus, we thank you. We praise you, for you are worthy. We thank you in your name. Amen. Okay, if you turn to 602, 602. What a wonderful and merciful Savior we have. Will you choose to follow Him? No turning back. Amen? Amen. Amen.